Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Dawson City Mayor Bill Kendrick. Dawson City is a cultural capital of the Yukon and is home to the Klondike Gold Rush. They are proud of their mining heritage and their First Nation roots that run millennia deep in the community. The city is a thriving cultural community with a post-secondary art school, several world-renowned festivals, and burgeoning TV and film industry that borders an outdoor playground sprawling hundreds of kilometers in either direction. They are a living historic community with many landscapes, features, and buildings that support their national historic site designation. Mining, tourism, culture, and the people are the foundation of which Dawson City stands, and the community respects personal freedoms and diversity of all definitions. Through solid planning and focused efforts, Dawson City has tackled municipal challenges, developed their municipal infrastructure, and grown into a vibrant community. So stay tuned, as we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Dawson City Mayor Bill Kendrick. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Mayor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by asking you an age-old question on this show, so you're no exception to that age-old question, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, I mean, when you choose to live, live in a community, and uh, I've always been sort of civic-minded and, you know, someone who follows the the news and, and pays attention to what's going on in one's community, so it seemed like a natural thing for me to do. Was municipal always the first choice or what, because civic no. minded can go provincially <laughs> or territorial or federally or municipal? I never what? thought, I never thought about municipal politics before. I guess I was, I recall being involved years ago down in the lower mainland in, in terms of uh, a controversial housing development in a floodplain that I sort of participated in the objections to. But no, I, I did not uh, have a childhood dream of being mayor or being in municipal politics. I mean, so I paid more attention to federal and, you know, and, and sort of provincial type politics, provincial growing up in Ontario, of course, and now I live in the Yukon. Do you mind me asking where in Ontario? I'm originally from Ontario as well. I'm in from the deep south, Windsor, Ontario. Oh, okay. So okay. I, we look north. I look north to Detroit. Oh, okay. Which I, I think it's an interesting place to grow up because you're Canadian, but you have a lot of American influences. <laughs> certainly do. Um, so I, I traditionally don't do a lot of research on my guests, but I do find out when they first stood for election. And from what I can gather, 2010 is when you first put your name forward for municipal office. Is that correct? Nine or 10. Uh, what had happened was a, a member of council had resigned. And I put my name in and I was the only person to put my name in at that point. So join <laughs> council. Yeah. So do you mind me asking what was going on at that time? Was it literally just a vacancy occurred? So you put your name forward or was there something going on in the community that you said, okay, this is my time. This is the time that I believe that my voice would be best on council. Well, there was, a, I think there was something going on to inspire that previous councillor to depart. I don't know if you're asking that as far as. No, no. Well, I want to know what, what you was were going on in my life. Yeah. What was, was going I on simply. In I had just bought a home. 
Okay. <laughs> a, few, a, month, a few months previous. And I thought, well, I'm here now. I want to be involved in my community. And so I stepped forward. So that so now being on council for almost 14 years, we're going up to the 14th year this year, has municipal politics and municipal governance changed a lot over those 14 years? I think so. Yeah. How so? I think uh, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. I think uh, it's a good question. How has municipal politics changed? Well, when I first joined council, uh, the mayor at the time, we just had council meetings. And after council meetings, we would meet in the back office, the mayor's office, which now is a sort of office, mayor's office, should I choose to go into the, to the administration building. But for the most part, it serves as a conference room. At that time, uh, council would go Go back there, crack a beer, <laughs> and discuss municipal things. Now, the the mayor after that uh, did away with that practice for the purposes of transparency and introduced the concept of the committee of the whole meeting. Right. So I think there's some there were some benefits of having that sort of debrief at the end of meetings and and uh just chatting about topics but it was also you know fundamentally a time for the mayor of the time to sort of you know sort of massage council members into uh, their perspective on things etc <laughs> From your perspective, though, because you you spent a few years as councillor and now in the last election, you became mayor and you're coming up to a potential re-election bit. I'm not sure if you've announced or not, because we might talk about that a little bit later. But in your time as mayor, you, you have had to deal with some very big things, the post-recovery of uh, COVID-19, sort of the global economic fortunes that have been going on. I recently just saw a letter on your social media page about you asking the Department of U Homeland Security in the United States to uh, look into the uh, most northern highway in through your community to the U.S. It, it seems like you're dealing with a lot more provincial, federal, and even national, international things that potentially you might not have been dealing with probably 10 years ago. Is that Would that be correct? I, I wouldn't say so necessarily. I think this community, and, and this is part of uh, I think an ongoing effort that needs to be done in the body politic, so to speak, where citizens possible, you know, not everyone understands jurisdictions and who's involved in what jurisdiction. And, and so you have a lot of folks, um, mayor and council are right in the community here at the grocery store on the street. And it's like forever, you're forever getting bombarded and peppered with requests, with desires to follow up. And, uh, you know, the this COVID had shut down this uh, border to the United States nearby for a couple of years. And then it came back with a dramatically reduced season and dramatically reduced operating hours. And it, it's upset a lot of people. I mean, that two to three weeks in September would could mean the difference between a tourist business being in the black or being in the red. And uh, so I think it was a multi-pronged effort from all levels of government, federal, territorial, municipal, to do, I mean, I didn't do much. I sent a few letters, right? I mean, last year I sent quite a few letters to various people with CCs, snail mail, the whole way, the whole uh, kit and caboodle. Um, fortunately, there has been some shift. I'm not taking responsibility for that. I'm just one part of the puzzle, right? From people ranging from the U.S. consular, the, the consulate down in Vancouver, to a member of parliament, to our minister of tourism and our premier, 
everyone's been making an effort to move the needle on this. So it's not often that as a municipality, we would wade into something like that. It's just the odd time. You mentioned getting stopped at the grocery store or in the community from residents. Um, when I speak to municipal leaders, and I hate painting a broad stroke here, but I'm going to a little bit, as I always do on the show, there seems to be an apathy when it comes to what's going on at City Hall or Town Hall or the day-to-day uh, -day operations of the municipal uh, governance, whether that be is as long as my water's turned on, my garbage is picked up and my taxes are low, we really don't care. In your community, do you get a sense that people understand what's going on at City Hall or is there an apathy? As long as my taxes are low, I'm comfortable with the way the city is moving. I think it's a mixed bag. You have some people very involved and very tuned in. There's been some folks that have tuned into just about every council meeting for the last year and a half. And you have others that might not even know who who's on council. And that, you know, ebbs and flows and, you know, wanes and waxes. And uh, we've had our share of controversies here, though. And I think one benefit of, of, of things like challenges with waste management or challenges seeing a new rec center get built are that more people take notice and hopefully there's less apathy in a sense you know um challenges and conflict in a sense almost invigorates people to participate that's one of the positives about it so i would say it's, it's mixed here um in case i don't have another opportunity to mention it I think it is interesting, though, that like Dawson, it's a town. It's called a, a city, Dawson City. Uh, our largest population, of course, was way back during the coal rush in 1899, 1900, et cetera, right? And this town was the biggest town west of Winnipeg and north of Seattle. Um, unlike, I, I'm going to go. Perhaps I'll get the ire of some other Yukon communities here, but we're a very diverse community and there's a lot of demands and a lot of desires. So we're kind of like a small town with big city dreams and hopes. So because we're not a white city, horse. You're the second largest community in yes. the Yukon, yeah, correct? That's, right. that's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. So continue. I apologize for interrupting there. but No, you, no, no. Saying... That was all I was going to say. Simply that I think one thing I've noticed over the last 14 years is increasing demands for the municipal government in, in all kinds of areas. And sometimes those areas are not our jurisdiction, but that's part of that sort of education and, and understanding of our democracy that continues, you know. Does, does the does the resident understand those jurisdictional boundaries? Because you, as mayor, understand where the pro, where the territory steps in, where the federal government steps in, and where the municipality steps in. But and I, and I I mean this with respect to every resident who might be listening to this. But the average resident goes, "You're the mayor. You said it so eloquently. You're the closest to the people. They know who you are. They probably see you more often than they see their MLA or they see their MP." So they're probably more likely to ask you about healthcare issues or education issues rather than talk to their MLA or MP. So how do you tell people that's not my jurisdiction without telling them that's not my jurisdiction because they're coming to you for a reason? Well, sometimes you just have to simply say, <laughs> that's not my jurisdiction. And I think council, city council can choose advocacy issues, right? The mayor can choose advocacy issues in their leadership role. And there's that gray area in there. But I, I think you, you got to give people a lot of credit. Most people do know what is territorial jurisdiction, what is municipal jurisdiction, what is federal jurisdiction. Um, otherwise, they might, yeah, they might come to me, but... I have to be blunt at times because I just can't manage the time otherwise. 
no you know, understandable it's too crazy it's too crazy yeah so I, I wanted to ask one last question before we turn to Dawson City as a whole and I want to ask sort of a overarching question to kick off this one is 14 years later you have made had to make some very tough choices on that council because you are one vote on that council and you are dictating the direction of your community but also the tax dollars that you collect in your community you know, probably after 14 years, you're not pleasing 100% of the people in your community on the decisions you make. And I don't care who you are, the mayor of the city of Vancouver to city of St. John's all the way up to Dawson City, you're not pleasing 100% of the people. How do you make the best choices for your community with the knowledge that you're going to upset some people? Well, of course, for the most part, these priorities and decisions, they're made by council. Right, they're made by five people. We we are in a we're in the so-called weak mayor system here. <laughs> the mayor in Dawson City does not have the powers of say the mayor of Toronto within their municipality. I'm sort of beholden to council on moving things along, and that doesn't always go well for the mayor. It sometimes does, right? Um, you just gotta. Keep putting one foot in front of the other and uh, and really hope that your colleagues are seeing seeing some of the issues the same as, as you are, right? No, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. Yeah. So I want to turn to Dawson City as a whole now, and I want to preface this question by ask, saying this. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council, not a direction of council, not even a policy of council. This is just his opinion and his opinion alone. So with that being said, uh, Mayor Kendrick, uh, I've got to ask, what do you see as the biggest challenge or challenges facing Dawson City today as of recording this interview? Well, there's many, of course, and thanks for saying as of recording of this interview, because it could change tomorrow. <laughs> um, housing and building a lot of availability is huge here. Um, I'm, we're challenged. Things take a long time. They involve multiple levels of government. The city of Dawson itself doesn't have a lot of land, but we do have some. Um, the Yukon government is a large landholder, of course, within the municipality, and so is trying to pitch in the local First Nation. We work with the Yukon government in large part on, on these developments. Um, it's been frustrating that as far as a residential subdivision of you know any size, has not been developed by the Yukon government since the 1990s. And there are some in the popper, and there's some before the Yukon Environmental and Socioeconomic Assessment Board right now that are moving along. But here we are three years into a term. It had, it had been hoped that those were going a year or two ago, right? So that's a big issue. And I could, we could talk further about that. I'm sure we will. <laughs> Another issue that's confronting Dawson is waste management and recycling. These are um, costs have escalated in that department, increasing regulations from and, and requirements for a landfill, for example. Um, the delivery model on those things, how to in, how to uh, do waste management and recycling for like peripheral users, people not in the historic core. Um, there's been a lot of uh, bumps along the road. We had a very effective uh, nonprofit called the Conservation Clonic Society that was doing the recycling a few years back and they were patiently waiting for a new diversion center that the city and Yukon government was putting together, but they eventually pulled out and so we have a diversion center on the edge of town that was sort of envisioned to work in conjunction with the downtown historic core depot. We have commercial operators, a business community that has received waste pickup and cardboard pickup 
from the municipality for many years, whether that's from municipal staff or private or, or contractors that have been contracted by the city. And there was a proposal earlier this year that that would be discontinued and private contractors would do that. Personally, I don't think the city was ready for that step. Time will tell if it is, whether or not it's even desirable. I have read a lot about how there are communities around the country that, although that has been the model and it's generally the model, um, that in order to encourage and streamline it all with recycling and extended producer responsibility and all that stuff, there might still be benefit of keeping it in the municipal framework, right? So these are all things that have to be explored. And uh, it was the waste management question that brought out a lot of people to one of our meeting uh, meetings. And I can't say enough about how when the public decides to not be apathetic and they want their voice heard, it can really move things, right? It can definitely do that. Um, minds get changed around that council table based on public feedback. And even if it's to take a better, more fulsome look at issues before making final decisions, even if it, it means making, getting more information to either back up or not back up a certain council or city position. I mean, this is good stuff. This is what municipal governments need to do to get that feedback, that constant feedback to engage the community more. Um, you would ask me about all kinds, like big topics. <laughs> so I, 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 I want to yeah, talk I mean, about housing. More, but those are a couple. <laughs> okay. So let's go back yeah. to housing for a second because yeah. I just wanted to make sure because uh, housing's on the top of every single municipal leader's mind right now when I talk to them from the smallest community all the way up to the largest municipality of Toronto. Housing, housing, housing. Now, yeah. You talked about how this is not just a municipal issue. This is a territorial and this is a federal issue, especially in places like Dawson City, because the land is owned by a lot of the federal and provincial, uh, the territorial government. So you have to work side by side with them. Okay. How do I ask this nicely without asking this nicely? What can the territorial government and the federal government do tomorrow to make your lives easier to build more houses? Well, one thing is maybe maybe putting more boots on the ground in the actual community to make things happen. Um, Whitehorse, bless their souls, you know, in the last 15 years has seen a whistle bend development take off more than a thousand, probably, I, I don't know, 1,300 lots. Who knows what it is, right? When you actually look at statistics, uh, Canada's population growth numbers, Dawson is not much behind Whitehorse. And when you look uh, on a per capita basis, you know, we should have had a hundred lots or something at least, right? <laughs> so we're behind the we're behind. And um I don't know if it's if it's just their staff work way more time on that or they get frustrated with all you know the various steps in the communities. I'm not sure. So that's one thing. So um do you have developers knocking on your door? Do you have developers We've, saying we want to build in Dawson, but we just can't because there's too many, too much red tape? Or what's the status of development in the community? We've had a few, um, a few outside, at least one outside one. Um, some some folks in town that are developers or at least part time developers with interest and stuff. And some of our more successful projects have been led by private developers. Right. And there are requests on the books that this council or the next council needs to wrap their head around and decide on, you know, doing a bit of work and deciding, yes, let's let that project go in that area. Right. Um, so I don't think it, it's not the same pressure, I'm sure, I'm guessing, as down south, that sort of private developer influence. 
I think Dawson City is a special place, and it's one of the things I fell in love with the place. It's like there are young families, young people, older people, whatever. They, they want a lot. They want to build a home, even if it's small, on a lot, even if that lot is small, right? We don't necessarily want to live in an apartment building. But we have a downtown core with an OCP right now that, you know, de designates higher density in the downtown historic core. And there's a lot, fair bit of vacant land, you know, right in our commercial core to do that. Um, so how do you balance the the growth of your community? Because the growth is there. People want, it sounds like people are yeah. wanting to build and there are people who are building in Dawson City. But there are probably people, and I'm going to be in Dawson literally at this airs on Monday, and I'll be there by Wednesday because I'm driving all the way up to Dawson City from Calgary. So I'm going to be uh -huh. there firsthand. And I'm probably going to hear, because I ask people when I'm there, mm -hmm. what are the challenges that they face? And they uh -huh. probably might say, well, the growth is happening, but we want to keep it the way it is. There's a reason why we moved to Dawson City. It's for the ambiance. It's for the small town charm. It's for the small town feel. So how do you balance, and I say this as you as the Royal U.S. Council and yourself, balance growth with the residents who are there thinking, we don't want it to change that much because we want it the way that we moved here for. Well, I think that that just the general constraint across the board is preventing sort of new housing, all of the things we've talked about, right? It's an important question and a key question, and one that I brought up in council, and one that I hope this council or the next council deals with, which is really taking stock at the sustainability of our community and maybe doing some work and some research on what is the ideal population here, right? What is a population that has, you know, can support business and local business and support doctors and a dentist and daycares, right? And do we have enough of those services for the population? And shall we get those services before we increase our population? These are all good questions. We're sort of, we're so kind of far behind, right? That those questions are somewhat moot at this moment, but that could change very quickly. Uh, Yukon Housing is building a 34. They tell us they're going to start this summer. I'm going to believe it when I see it. I'm really hopeful they're going to build it. They're going to replace a 34 unit uh, Yukon Housing uh, unit uh, apartment type building right in the downtown core, right? We have 34 or so country residential lots that on Yukon government land, that's the Dredge Pond 2 subdivision. It's um, before uh, council has some zoning changes to do. It's before the Yukon Environmental Social Economic Assessment Board. This is a Klondike Highway subdivision um, just around the bluff of the historic core that's got, oh, it's got 200 lots or something coming, right? It's just been, it's been painful to, to, to want to see these things for, in my case, 14 years, and it's just been so slow, you know. And so I, I I'm going yeah. to bring it back a little bit here for a second, because you mentioned yeah, something, please. and I, I've got to ask this question before we turn to my next segment, because I'm cautious of time. But yeah. you, you talked about what type of community you want, what type, what what's the population, what are the services you want? This is kind of the chicken and the egg theory, right? Because what comes first? Does the chicken come first or the egg come first? Does the housing come first or the services come first? Because at the end of the day, businesses won't come to your community if you're not a certain population, but housing won't come if you don't have services to sort of offset that. So in your mind, as mayor of the community in 2024, in on May 3rd, what does come first in your mind? Do you think that it is the housing that comes first and then services will follow? Or is it services need to come as well in conjunction with housing? Well, I think, again, because we've been so lack of new, there's been such a lack of new housing, even a minimal amount, <laughs> and a lack of building lots, even a minimal amount, and just so many roadblocks here and there and everywhere, that could come, right? 
And there's other projects like there's a daycare that is looking to to build. They've done a feasibility report, all that stuff. They're 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 wanting land to do that on. Um, and we have a lot of services here, right, in Dawson City. I think we're pretty good. I, I think you know, uh, it's it's a nice community to live in, and I think. Again, we need a modest amount of housing. We should probably do a lot of more research on sustainability, you know, emergency preparedness, our ability to respond to to challenges like when the highway gets blocked off, right? Um, we we should have a fifty year, a hundred year sort of uh, lens on things, right? So that we don't build in an awkward, unsustainable way. Right. We wanted I my you know my my desire would be to see a as compact a community as possible. Yes, we have peripheral folks around um that drive in and out of town, and of course that will continue. Um, you know, I'm guilty as anybody to getting my vehicle and, and zipping around because of time management and you know having to do errands or whatever. But it's nice when we're in a little bowl, which you'll see soon. It's great to hear you coming to Dawson City. That's awesome. There's so much, but there's so much potential here for just this wonderful place to keep being wonderful. And so it, I don't know ahead. how else to say it. Hopefully, other people can get a sense of what I'm talking about and and agree with me or not. I don't know. So what's the thing that you're proud about the community? Because every community has their challenges and we've bit, literally done the Coles note version of some of the challenges that you've uh, talked about, but what, what's the thing that you are proud about when you go talk to other municipal leaders or you leave your community and you boast about your community, what's that thing that you boast about? Well, there's many things and I'm probably going to miss some things here in answering your question, but we are a creative community, you know, and we're a diverse community. We have creatives, filmmakers, artists, authors, right? We have a very strong local First Nation, the Tronic Witchin. Um, and and this city council, which of course municipality has a different jurisdiction than uh, First Nation uh, within the uh, you know settled land claims. Uh, nations here in the Yukon, which Tronic Witchin is one. Um, there's, you know, we're all in this community. Everyone supports and and is uh, votes for the local municipal council, right? Um, and I've heard of struggles in other northern towns between their councils with their set of responsibilities and First Nations and how troubled they are. And I'm not saying it's perfect here, but we have regular meetings, regular scheduled meetings with the First Nation here. And the First Nation has settlement lands way out of the municipality and a whole suite of different uh, concerns, right? But we're kind of in this Dawson city together and that's a wonderful thing. We have, um, we have very resourceful and intrepid uh, and intrepid mining community and all those folks, you know, we have challenges with mining right in the municipal core because of legacy claims and stuff. But I'm talking about in the periphery, in the gold fields that uh, support and have helped grow our community over 125 years. Um, we have an art school. A foundation university year. We have a, a, a Yukon University uh, campus here. Um, we have heritage of all sorts, the First Nation heritage, the gold mining heritage. We have great builders with an eye on energy efficiency and sustainability, right? We have a beautiful, beautiful nature around us, right? Um, and Tombstone Mountain, uh, a short drive away, and 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 mountains and rivers and trees. And if, I'm not saying everything's perfect, and all of these things I've talked about have their challenges, 
for example, the local art, art foundation here, they have students who want to come up here, but housing continues to be a challenge for those students, right? So it's all sort of, it's all sort of connected. Um, it's unique and it is, it, it, I think one thing that a lot of folks bristle at from all walks of life is if there's folks that are coming in from a, I'm not going to mention any town so and so, I don't want to get in trouble, that have a sort of, you know, let's cleanse this or, or make this, you know, normal or something. I don't think we're big fans of that. You know, we want to keep being a little bit weird here in Dawson City, I think, I hope. Could be wrong. But uh, that's one of the the charms that attracted me to this place. And I think it's attracted a lot of people to this place. And, you know, when you visit next week, you might find that charm as well. So let's talk about next week for a second here, if you don't mind, because uh, Dawson City is going to be put on the proverbial municipal map because you have politicians from all three levels of government descending upon uh, Dawson City for the Association of Yukon Communities Convention, which kicks off Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And I will be there covering the event, so I'm excited to be up there and visiting. Um, what are some of the tourist spots that these people should be seeing in Dawson City? Because I, I know we just talked about some of the great things, but is there a local hotspot that you need people to see when they're in the community? Because I'm coming and I, I like the off the beaten path tourist destinations. I don't want the ones that the, the territorial or provincial governments promote. I want the one that the mayor recommends. So what's that one spot oh. in town that you recommend? And yes, it's Sophie's uh, choice here the mayor <laughs> that's a lot of pressure and you know it could, it could actually align with what the tourist operators and the territorial government's recommending too i mean you gotta pop into the westminster hotel to that bar it's one of the only bars that have the original building you know i think that one's from 1901 we have an excellent trail that that goes around town, the Ninth Avenue Trail, and then it goes down to the the dike along the Yukon River, and that's a, that's a wonderful asset, right? Our little ski hill is closed for the season, but we have world class mountain biking trails from the top of the dome here. So going up onto the dome, um, with a mountain bike, or even just to drive up there and, and take a take around the, you can see the top of the world from there. You can see the mountains of the. Uh, the, the Ogilvy Mountains, et cetera, right? Um, a lot of people are drawn to the getting the drink with the mummified toe. Um, that's, uh, it's either at the El Dorado Hotel or the downtown hotel. And that's, that was a strange tradition started, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years ago where uh, someone bequeathed their uh, toe and it's, it's kept on salt and it gets thrown into a, a shot glass and people drink it and then they get a certificate and they're well over a hundred thousand people that have taken that. And that's a big hit for some. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things to do. There's great little coffee shops, uh, uh, a really unique uh, cafe and restaurant called Bon Ton, which um supports all kinds of local Yukon and Dawson uh, agriculturalists. And they feature local meats and local cheeses and local vegetables. And it, it's, it's, it's a really nice treat. There are, you know, there are people in Dawson city that are, you know, they decided to live here because of that little cafe. <laughs> so it's all around us. There's neat things. Um, you're going to be arriving right, you know, right as winter has ended and spring is ramping up. Um, there's still a bit of ice along the Yukon River, and it hasn't fully broken, as far as I recall, a, a day ago upstream of us. But the Klondike has broken. The uh, risk of uh, a flood in the Klondike Valley has, has gone down now. There's no risk at the moment. So... Um, there's so lots to see you here, and I and there's Bombay Peggy's, which is a 
which is a, a, a little inn that serves uh, cocktails. It, it, it was a, a brothel house that got moved to another location. You know, Dawson City, uh, um, a lot of unique buildings around here, of course, new and old, because it's, you know, again, this was the Paris of the North in the gold rush, 1899, 1900. And in many ways, it still is. I, I like to tell people this is a cosmopolitan place. There are people from all around the world that live here. We're very diverse. We're very accepting of people of all types. And I think we, for the most part, no one has to dwell on that stuff. You know, it's like we're moving on and we're all, we hope to be all a big, happy family here in Dawson City. And uh, people are free to be what what they want to be, you know. And not, Mayor of course, not harm others in, in, in doing that, right? And it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting place. And I'm so, sure you're going to enjoy it. I, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. So my final question, because I have to ask this, because it's the million dollar yep. question to end every interview is, what makes Dawson City, in your mind, such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Hmm. Well, it is unique. It is still wild. We don't have, except for Front Street, we don't have pavement. We don't have stoplights, right? And to me, that's not just about heritage and making it look gold rushy. It's really about, you know, not necessarily having to have those multinational chain signs in our town, right? It's 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 different. I think maybe that's it. It's like we're different. And we're connected to the world. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there's some folks up here that maybe think that, oh, we're, you know, the world doesn't influence us at all. And that's obviously not true. We're part of the Canadian system and all that stuff, but it's, we're different and we have a unique heritage. We have a, a Toronto uh descendants here that have lived in the area for millennia. You know, it's, it's, it's a neat place. I don't Hopefully, I'm not going to go, oh, I wish I, I'm sure I will in 20 minutes ago. Oh, I should have mentioned that. But uh, yeah, cosmopolitan, different, unique, a little bit off the beaten path. And for the most part, accepting of and tolerant of, of different types of people, right? That's awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to visiting this week uh, as of airing this week, uh, as of uh, recording next week. Um, Mayor, thank you so much for sitting down with me and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. So much appreciate it. Hey, no, it's been enjoyable. I can't believe how quickly the time rolled by. And uh, you, uh, just a little suggestion for your drive. Don't forget about Liard Hot Springs. If you time it right, you can have a nice relaxing soak and take off many miles of, of your stress on the way to Dawson City. Now, if you've enjoyed today's episode, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth interviews like you saw today on the cross-border interviews where we sit down with municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Or our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to source for municipal news committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged, but your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, most importantly, but as always, just keep talking. 